from the magnificent Midwest, this is the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives regarding men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you in part by Let's Get Real, where forensic accountant Tiffany Couch uses her financial skills to shine the light on the real issues we all face every day. If you would like to make decisions based on facts rather than on rhetoric and cultural pressures, go to letsgetreallife.com, a place where you can find tools to improve your communication skills and to increase your connection to humanity. That's letsgetreallife.com. Today on the show, as it happens, we're going to talk with Tiffany Couch about a very delicate subject known as money and shame. But first, a few quick announcements. Actually, they're not going to be quick, (laughs) so bear with me. Um, A couple of things. First of all, I love hearing from you all about what you think of this show, what you like, what you don't like, what you want to see more of, what you want to hear less of. Um, this This is really important for me because this show is for you, and you're not going to hurt my feelings, so just please reach out with whatever those thoughts are. Don't be shy. You can do that at Suzanne at the Suzanne show.com. Okay. Also, I have a new shop page on my site at Suzanne where you'll find my new ebook, how to be a wife, seven secret steps to a peaceful and passionate relationship with your man. And by the time this is up, the audio version should be available. So that's very exciting because a lot of people have been asking me, are you going to have this as an audio book, which ta-da, I listened and I finally now have it. Also, please don't forget to become a Patreon supporter. I really don't want this show to go away. I don't think you want it to go away. And the best way to make sure that happens is to support me. Just go to the the thesuzannevenkershow.com and scroll down until you see the Become a Patron button, where you'll find four very economical levels as well as free gifts for signing up. And if you have a business you want to promote, there's even an option for that. Finally, I want to take a moment to explain how working with me as a coach is different from working with a marriage counselor. There are three main ways. One, you may have noticed that many counselors will not tell you the hard truths you need to hear about the delicate relationship between the sexes. That's just not how they roll because they're beholden to certain things that they can say and they can't say that require them to be politically correct. So for example, you won't hear them talking about why wives earning more than their husbands undermines a relationship or even how both parents working full time and year round with young kids is harmful to the family and why. Those are not topics they're going to touch, and yet they're affecting your lives every day. That's what makes coaching different. It's not about the degrees on the wall, but about the experience that someone has dealing with what you're dealing with. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather hear from someone who's been there, done that, and who's willing to talk about her own struggles with marriage than with someone whose personal life you know nothing about. But maybe that's just me. The second reason is that while there are many good marriage counselors out there, the arrangement itself is far from ideal. The once a week or once every other week 50 minute session barely scratches the surface with respect to what goes on on the days in between. That's why one of the very first things I did when I became a coach is to set up the ability for couples to get in touch with me in between our sessions. So not only do husbands and wives get a full hour with me, they get access to me via WhatsApp on the days in between. Third, while I occasionally check in with both partners, I mainly work with wives because they are the relationship navigators. Men tend to respond to women rather than the other way around. Again, this is not the kind of thing you're going to hear a marriage counselor say. So those are the main reasons why coaching is different, at least with me. If you were, for those of you who, you know, asked or wondered um, about what coaching actually is and how it differs from marriage counseling. So if you feel stuck in your marriage and you're desperate for guidance that's real and that works, just go to my website, SuzanneVenker.com and click on coaching at the top to sign up for your free 30-minute discovery call. Most of us have been conditioned to not talk about our finances. But for many people, confronting their issues with money is crucial to having a successful personal relationship with money, as well as having a healthy marriage. Our culture places, unfortunately, a high premium on financial success, and far too many people blame themselves if they aren't keeping up with their peers. But when we shame ourselves for our past financial decisions or for our current financial situation, we are incapable of making change. To move forward and make real change, you must learn how to cope with your shame in a way that makes it lessen over time. 
Here with me today to discuss how to overcome money shame is forensic accountant Tiffany Couch, whose career has brought her face to face with this issue every day. Welcome back to the show, Tiffany. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to have you here. This is going to be really great. Very personal, very important, a little bit different from my regular guests. I don't even think of you as a guest per se. I do and I don't. You know, you're um, a wonderful supporter of this program. And I know we've had you on before. Um, and I just, I told you then that I wanted to have you back to talk about this very big issue. So I'm going to start by telling you all what I came across yesterday when I was doing research for this. And that was this TED talk from this gal named Tammy Lally, L-A-L-L-Y, if you want to look up the TED talk. And she tells this story of how her brother, she says, quote unquote, was caught in our family's money shame cycle. And basically what happened was he was married with kids. He was deeply in debt. And he ended up committing suicide. And she then reads the stats about white middle-aged men and the the stats on suicide, which is off the charts these days. And it's almost always related to money and their ability to provide and and what's happened with with their careers and whatnot. And what she said in that TED Talk was this. What I've learned is that our self-destructive and self-defeating financial behaviors are not driven by our rational, logical minds. Instead, they are a product of our subconscious belief systems rooted in our childhoods and are so deeply ingrained in us that they shape the way we deal with money our entire lives. So whether or not you, as an end quote there, and then she went on to say, basically, how do you think of yourself when it comes to money? Are you lazy? Are you crazy? Are you stupid? Are you just bad with money? This is what's known as money shame. And a lot of people think that it has to do with how much you have in the bank account, in your bank account. You and I are going to talk about this. It's so, so, so wrong, as I know you feel strongly about and we're going to talk about. It doesn't matter whether you make a little bit of money or a lot. That's a big misconception. You can drive a Mercedes, but your budget, this is the way she phrased it, you can drive a Mercedes, but your budget can only afford a Honda, right? So you're basically covering up your shame about your salary by trying to up it in the eyes of everybody else. So that's what that's an example of what money shame is. It's essentially about being dishonest about who you really are and what your circumstances really are. So we're going to get real with this. And that's why I had you, Tiffany. Let's get real. That's your thing. And as a forensic accountant, that's your thing. You have seen this up close and personal in working with people and their money as it and as it relates to shame. So tell us really quickly again, for those who missed the last podcast with you, what a forensic accountant does. So I'm your non-traditional CPA. I don't do taxes or traditional financial statement audits. 100% of what I do is investigate white collar crime. I help people through litigation when uh, money is on the line or a contract is on the line and or, you know, they're getting a business divorce or a marital divorce and there's money involved in all of it. And really quickly, I, I want to tell people where if they need those services, I know that you are, you know, you support this program with your let's get real life.com site, but tell people where they can find you if they need your services. I think that would be helpful. Oh, yes. So we are at acuityforensics.com and that's A-C-U-I-T-Y forensics with an S on the end. Great. Okay. So tell and give us an example of what you saw or see. Um, that has to do with shame as it pertains to these people's stories and, and with, you know, with respect to money. So I learned this really early in my career and I was so thankful for this lesson. Um, but I was investigating, um, a big, um, a loan that my client's long-term controller had put on the book or had never put on the books, but he had found out that his controller had borrowed $780,000 from him and didn't tell him. And so when I went and to investigate the loan and figure out how much you know, was owed on this loan that was never put on the books, I realized this was not a loan. This was theft. 
I was up to about $1.2 million of theft, clear theft. And I went in to tell him about it. And I always say, you know, I probably bebopped into his office because I was a brand new baby accountant, excited to, um, you know, find this big fraud. And this man who was a man's man, he's a farmer. I grew up with farmers. They're men's men. They don't cry. They're stoic. He reacted 100% opposite than anything that I had ever been trained for or even thought would happen. And he got up from uh, the table we were sitting at and went and stared out the window for what felt like eons. And when he turned around, he was crying. And he said, what's wrong with me? And I, 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 I said, what do you mean what's wrong with you? He said, what's wrong with me? that I didn't see this coming? What's wrong with me that I didn't see that Dave was doing this to me? How can you be telling me this? And I realized that this had nothing to do with the $1.2 million. This had everything to do with the betrayal and the shame and, and um, the just all of the emotions that went along with what was going on. And that happened. And then I started investigating fraud. It was my job. And every client, and I mean every client, whether they were a small business owner to Suzanne, to a to a CEO of a publicly traded company, I've had to hand Kleenex to and tell them, I'm really sorry this is happening to you. It doesn't matter if they're a small business owner or if they're the CEO, literally, of a publicly traded company. It doesn't matter if they're a wife or a husband. It doesn't matter if they're a business partner or female or male. It is it is all of this shame and all of this emotion tied around uh, to money. And I started realizing that um, when my clients call, the first thing I've trained my cli- my staff to do is to say, I'm really sorry you have to call us. How can we be helpful? Okay. So I want to, as you know, um, channel this specifically into marriage and relationships. And I know you gave an example of a divorcing spouse who never touched the money and doesn't understand any, any of it. And then something happened that, in other words, that same kind of deal that you just explained with the business partner, only it's husband and yep. wife. So tell me about that. Yep. And then we're going to go into talking about financial intimacy in a marriage. Sure. Um, I I do a lot of uh, work in a in divorce litigation. So, and a big part of what I do is try and figure out how much one spouse or the other is making so that proper support or the proper splitting of the assets can occur during the divorce. And I cannot tell you how many spouses I've met with, both male and female, who come to my office and they say, well, I gave my spouse every, my spouse did everything. He or she went to work, he or she paid all of the bills or even took my paycheck and paid all of the bills with it. Or uh, my other favorite, we kept everything separate. So I have no idea how much he or she makes. Um, And they're embarrassed. They don't want to tell their lawyer. They don't even want to tell me that um, how that they don't know. They don't want to tell me how much debt they're in. They don't want to tell me that they have no idea how much money they even make themselves, let alone what their spouse makes. Um, It is it is shocking, really, uh, to to see how many people are in that situation today. No question. No question. In fact, in my coaching, the, the clients across the board, I cannot tell you how many people are not not only not only are they not combining finances but they don't even know what's in each other's respective bank accounts, which the whole setup from the get-go shouldn't be that way in my opinion. But okay. So that gets into, that gets into the whys of all of that, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I want to talk with you about today is that this all about the why. So when, when you have a spouse who doesn't want to get involved with the finances, Oftentimes they might use the, the excuse of it's just too I don't have time right or it's just too time consuming or it's too um, it's too much I can't deal with the thought of it or, or whatever. 
more often than not, there's something else going on there, in my opinion, that you really don't want to know. It's not just a matter of, I'd like to be blissfully unaware, because ultimately, that's never going to be good. Never. Obviously, it's not going to go down well. You have to face it. So then that gets into, why are you not, right? What is it that you're afraid of when you're not combining finances or, or and or are staying out of it and letting the other person, as you described, take care of it all. There's things there that you're not wanting to face. And that's where the word, I guess, that we're going to use today is shame, which is a strong word. And I want to talk a little bit about some some money issues that people might have that aren't necessarily shame, too. They're just sort of, um, uh, I don't know, narratives or scripts that you learned growing up um, that, that are maybe are dysfunctional or don't work right, but they're not necessarily shame. So I'm going to come back to asking you about that, but let's talk about, let's talk about what those money scripts are that we live with wherein shame manifests itself. So I know you have a whole list here and we're going to go through them, uh, one by one. The two things I hear most often is I just don't have time. So I let my spouse do it. Or the other one where shame is underneath it is I don't understand. So I gave it to him or her to deal with. Um, it's too complicated. And so those are the two things that, that we really need to, if you're saying those to yourself, or if your spouse is saying that there is something underneath those two scripts, that's much deeper than I don't have time, or I don't understand, because these are not complicated um, kinds of issues to deal with in most households. Bingo. They are not complicated. It's really the the crux of it is that it's emotional, that it's deep, that it's related to who how we think of ourselves and what we want and how we think of you and you know you mean the other person. It, it's complex, but it's not complicated, right? Correct. That's great. <laughs> um I mean even for people who say they're not money people, you know, honestly, like a monkey can put you know, if you can add you can you can create a budget. So if you're resistant to having a budget, for instance, it's not because you don't know how to make one. It's because you don't want to live on one or you're That's afraid right. of how you're going to connect with your spouse on being able to live on a budget. So it's a marital problem, not a math problem. Correct. It, this is third grade math. We, we can do this all day. Absolutely. Okay. So let's go to some of those money scripts. Um, I'm going to actually list them really quickly and then we'll go back. Let me do it that way. Is That's that okay? Yes, we, okay. Okay. These are the things that you that you had on your um, money shame post. I'm embarrassed by the amount of debt I have. I grew up poor and don't want anyone to know. I've made all this money but have nothing to show for it. I'm embarrassed by the amount of debt I have. If anyone knew how poor I was, they wouldn't like me. I make great money but would like more. And that I should be ashamed of feeling that. I didn't earn any of the money I have. It was just given to me. Uh And then this one, which might surprise some people, I make so much money, I'm embarrassed. Uh Okay, so that's a long list. And chances are, if you're listening to this program, one of those, one of those probably hit you in the gut. That would be my guess, because that's a lot of different, you have a lot of different options on where you might fall in there. It would be very surprising that somebody didn't relate to one of those, I would think. So tell me, let's begin with, have you seen every single one of these in your work? Is that I've seen every single one in my work, and I've experienced them, and my husband has different ones than I do. And so, and my friends and I have talked about these. So um, I have seen this in my profession and I have seen this in my personal life. And um, I'm super intrigued to unravel it all because um, the more I talk about it, the more I realize everybody has these underlying messages, but nobody's talking about it. And I I say, you know, shame is there for a reason, right? And, and, and in the culture that shame is somehow taboo and we're not supposed to be shamed for anything anymore, I really think that's a detriment to us in so many ways. But in terms of money, oh my gosh, if we started to unravel these shame messages, how could our relationship with money change? And it's a super powerful idea. Absolutely. Okay, so I, how about I go first? I'll tell you my, my story okay. a little bit and then you tell me yours. How's okay, that? let's do it. Okay, so my the message that I got, and so much of this is about 
you know, when we're going to get to how to change your relationship with money and, um, well, yeah, that, how to change your relationship with money. And to do that, we're going to, you have to begin by thinking about what your original message about money was as a kid. So here's mine. My mother was what you call, and there's actually a term for this, believe it or not, an underspender. <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, yeah, she grew up in the Great Depression. Her father lost his job, never worked again. Mother, grandmother went to work to support the family. She had a college degree, believe it or not. She was born in the 19th century. Um, and she ran the St. Louis Library here. And they um, uh, scraped by, lived in an apartment, never had a house, three generations under one roof. Grandma was in there. Um, and she used to say, my mother, about her mother, she could stretch a dime into a dollar and make <laughs> a whole rack of lamb last for an entire week. So I... So, so my mom carried this with her throughout her life, even later on when she and my dad eventually had plenty of money, she held on to that same mindset that she was raised with all the way up till she died. And the biggest fight in my parents' marriage, one of them, <laughs> was her inability, uh, how do I say this? A, her inability to spend money, for sure. Mm -hmm. But B, her fighting every single cent. Mm. There's really no way to explain the scope of it unless you live with it, with this particular thing. But it would be so bad that if you'd go through, um, what do you call those things? You know, let's say you're at the airport and you got to pay for the parking, you know, whatever. You're standing there and, and right, you're giving right. your ticket and they right. say, oh, that'll be $5 for the parking or whatever. She'd say, $5? Oh. Well, and then you'd have a conversation about it. And then you'd get to her wallet. And like, you, when you handed it to the person, it was like you were handing over a million dollars. Right. It was that dramatic. Now, I want you to think about that feeling as a kid yeah. and multiply it by 18 years of this. And you can understand what my takeaway has been and what my residual issues spending money are. And I think I've inadvertently passed it on to our kids. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of great stuff going down money, money wise in our home messages wise. So hopefully that offsets the, this, this other piece, but they are definitely not spenders <laughs> either. Yep. So, so that's my story. My husband's is different as you pointed out. Um, but, and so we come together with these different mindsets when we are dealing with our own finances. His was basically, there was never enough. Um, but he just did without and made do after a divorce. He went from a, a one standard of living to a completely different one and that mm -hmm. going down instead of up. And that's, that affected him dramatically, um, for completely different reasons. Anyway, so that's my story. I don't know which one that would fall in one of these uh, things that we just read. Um, but money hoarding, money hoarding is a thing. Money hoarding, yeah, yeah. Money hoarding. There you go. And I don't think I hoard at all. No, but I know my mother did. And I know that the ability, the thing that was passed to me is that it's painful. I do not hoard. I definitely don't, but it is painful to spend. I cannot deny that it is painful. And I'm trying to get that out of me and say, Suzanne, it's okay. In fact, so if you were to say, if I were sitting here with Dave Ramsey, which I might bring this up later because <laughs> my husband and I are really into Dave Ramsey. We listen to him every day. And as I said earlier, we're going to have his daughter on in a few weeks to talk about her new book. So we're going to be covering money again on the Yay. Suzanne Banker show. But if he were here, I, you know, he talks a lot about making sure you pay yourself when you do your budget. That's where my husband and I fail every time. It's our biggest, weakest, or, I mean, our biggest, yeah, our biggest weakness is not having that line item for fun and to pay ourselves and feel okay about it. Cause we're just too, too responsible if there is such a thing. Oh, so that's, that's my story. <laughs> we, we What's used yours? to be that way. My story is, um, I, my parents both came from nothing. Um, they grew up with parents from the depression and, you know, in their families, there was never enough. Um, 
You know, I, my grandparents, even my aunts who were older than my dad could remember living in tents, uh, coming back, you know, from the Dust Bowl into California and having no shoes to go to school. Um, wow. And so those were the messages I heard uh, from my grandparents. And while my parents, um, you know, my, my, I had a grandfather who would gamble and lost everything. And my mom and her brother and sister or brothers had to, you know, live in our, aunt's um, garage. And, um, you know, my, my grandmother, or my dad's mother, she would not only um, spend all of the money my grandfather would make, but um, she one time took all of my dad's hard earned money out of his bank account to go dancing and, and took his money. So those were my parents' relationships with money. And so, you know, they come together and um, I'm a child of the 80s. So my mom worked full time. My dad, of course, worked full time. And um, they both made money. Um, And my dad loved to give, like he would, like if he went to the grocery store without my mother, he would come home with tricks and uh, cereal and, um, you know, all of the treats from the grocery store, or he would pick something up for the kid, for me and my brother and and give us gifts. Um, My mother was punitive with money. Um, She, my mom was punitive with it. So she uh, never wanted to give money. And there are, have been a few times in my life when she was very generous with money. And to me, it was like the only time I felt like, oh, she actually really likes me. And so I had these mixed messages at home, right? I had a dad who, you know, loved to give gifts. And then I had a mom who used it as power, right? She used it as power over Same. you. Yep. Same. Yeah. I, yep. yeah. And so, um, and then my husband grew up very, very poor and never enough. So again, we come together and uh, I will tell you that my tend I and then of course I'm a CPA. So he abdicated, my husband abdicated 100% mm-hmm. of the money to me. And I, of course, love the control. We talked about all of that in our first um, podcast. So, you know, for the first 10 or 15 years of our marriage, I handled it all. I handled all of the budget. I paid all the bills. I, um, you know, made sure the taxes, if we did a mortgage, I, I, you know, put all the stuff together. And um, I started realizing like if I died, he would have no idea how to run this house. And so I, we started having conversations like that. Like you just need to know, because if I die or I'm getting too busy at work or whatever, Mm -hmm. you need to know. Uh, But I will tell you that uh, my big shame has been over and over and over again. And I finally, I believe I've unraveled it is, I have made so much money in my career and I, uh, for a long time, had nothing to show for it. And the amount of shame I had over the fact that here I came from nothing or a lot, not me personally, but my grandparents and my ancestors and then my parents, you know, they worked really hard. And here I am making a really nice living. And for the longest time, Suzanne, I had nothing to show for it. Nothing in the bank, Mm -hmm. nothing in a 401k, living paycheck to paycheck. And uh, all of that shame show um, was really, was really starting to impact me. And, um, and we, my husband and I really started to talk about it. I started reading books and, you know, here we are, you know, six or so years later. So what happened? What, what, what was the turnaround? What did you do? Two things. Um, I was working with a coach and she started talking to me about money uh, messages. And I read a couple of books. I read um, a book by, uh, I've read a few books, The Soul of Money. I can't remember the woman that wrote her. I think her name's Lynn. Can't remember her name. Uh, Jen Sincera wrote a book called You're a Badass at Making Money. And that's sort of a fun book. And then Kyle Cease wrote a book called The Illusion of Money. And it goes all about that TED Talk you're talking about. But this idea of this culture that we're in, that who we are is based on the amount of money we make or how much money's in our bank account or not. That is just crazy. That's it's that's not crazy. true, right? But it's just the message we continue to give ourselves. And so um, it was sort of like, enough is enough. And um, the first thing we did, Suzanne, I have to tell you, is we, we, we paid ourselves first from the business. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, we were very much the same way. Oh, we, we have all these obligations or we have all of this debt. And um, we had to start unraveling that. And sometimes the only way to unravel that, that is just by action. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And I, yeah, because I, I would say that my, my husband, I mean, we've been married 22 years. We've only recently faced all of this down to the down to the nitty gritty where I'm not sure there's anywhere left to go. Um, right. I mean, we, at this point, I mean, that's the last thing we said to each other is we've just got to start paying ourselves. This is ridiculous. This is why we feel on edge all the time. We're not, we're not giving ourselves permission to enjoy anything. And right. it, it comes from, it comes from different messages, but we ended up in the same place. Cause mine was all about, his was about scarcity. It just simply wasn't there. Right. Right. In my case, same for husband. there was plenty there. That's the problem. There was, it was there, but she wouldn't touch it. And right. then, and then my dad wanted to, but he, but she kind of controlled it. And then if you did get it, it was just like you said, there were strings attached and there was power attached to it. So there's those, that's all messed up. So we wanted to do things very, very differently. And we have with our family, but with each other, I don't think we ever got past that hump of, Hey, you know, we, we deserve a, a dollar two here and there. We do work our asses we off. Do. So come on. We do. If we're working this hard um, and I do work really hard and so does he, wh- why in the world Do we, why are we doing this to ourselves? Right. Right. And it's not about spending. And so one of the things I would do, I realized was I was spending, I I was spending all of my money. I was giving it away um, and sometimes literally giving it away, um, but also just spending it on, on nothing. And yeah, to fill a hole. And that's the other thing, you know, people spend money to fill holes that have nothing to do with money. Right. Okay. So let's talk about how to have a healthy relationship with money first individually, and then also within marriage. Um, you know, I think that I clearly the beginning steps to that has to do with what we're doing right now, which is to, to go back to what your takeaway was as a child. And we've listed a bunch of them here. Um, I'm going to give an example of something else that, that stays, that has stayed with me. And that's my ex mother-in-laws, my former mother in law I don't like the word ex. <laughs> I was married before. I think most people know that. If you don't, I was four years, no kids in my twenties. I've talked about that a little bit before. And I had um, wonderful in-laws um, whom I loved very much. And, but however, I, this is my memory of those years with them. And what I know my ex-husband, uh, the message he got growing up. And that was that the mother was very very emphatic that there was not enough money and that she wanted more. So the idea of hearing, we must have more money. We must have more money. Mm. It was a daily, uh, you know, and make more money, make more money, make more money. And then an, an initial, basically a backhanded slight to her husband that he doesn't make enough and mm-hmm. she's suffering in this, in this job that she had to do. And I didn't think a whole lot about it at the time, quite honestly, obviously, um, I was in my own world, but now looking back, I see very clearly how my former husband, you know, what, what, what he, what he heard growing up and what he ended up doing with those messages. Right. So I think when you, and, and, and he's not the only person I know like that, but that's as close as I got to that, that other family story where you're just, there's parents who just sort of instill in their kids that to make money, to make money, to make money. And it's such a strong message. You're either going to retain. In fact, he and his brother, he's, there's three boys. Two of them are very successful. He being one of them. And one of them went in the completely other direction. Yep. And that's not a coincidence. That's not. A no, it's not. Not even a little. I I um, had a, I've been writing about money on my blog and I had a guy, it was during COVID. He emailed me and he said, this money thing is BS. He said, I've done everything, you know, I, I've done everything you say. And, and I'd only written a few things. He said, but, you know, I'm, I'm barely making enough money. Um, you know, my, my restaurant business went down and now I'm trying to, you know, I'm just delivering groceries. And I said, dear client, he wasn't really a client, but I said, tell me about being 10 or 15. What was happening in your house? And he goes, what does this have to do with anything? And I said, don't question me. Just tell me what was happening. And he said, well, my mother, um, not only was my mother working, but I had to work too. 
And my mother would take all of my money and she would spend it on her uh, drinking and gambling Mm. as a teenager. Right. So he's Mm. delivering papers and doing all these things. And, and, and so, so then I said, and I knew a little bit about him and I said, and then you got married to somebody who handled all the money. He's like, yes. And I said, so you don't really want to, you've just abdicated your money to all of these women in your life. How, how did you figure this out? And I go, well, it's all about that. And, and, and so we had this whole conversation about how he felt like he never had any control over his money. And he goes, I feel like I need to go talk to little, and I'll just call him Dan, little Dan. And he said, and, and maybe rearrange some of those messages he learned when he was a kid. And he wrote me back a week later. <laughs> and he said, Tiffany, I just got a contract to do this. And I just, um, you know, you know, do, or quadruple was like quadrupled the amount of money he was making doing the the Instacart and the you know the DoorDash or whatever he was doing. And he said, "It is so true that all of this is so tied to what we believe about ourselves, and we it's so ingrained that we don't even know that it's that it's coming from that place from so so long ago." <sighs> I want to let's talk about two specific scripts that I think do not get any play. I think mm-hmm. it's kind of obvious if a person has a lot of debt that they're going to feel bad about themselves and sure. they're not going to want anyone to know. And that makes sense. And until you 100%. get yourself on a budget and get out of debt, you're not going to really feel good about yourself. I mean, that, that one's kind of obvious. Let's talk about these other two that I actually, you know, I, I come in contact more with and you probably to do too. One of them is um, people who make good or even great money but they they'd actually like more and right. they feel ashamed for wanting more. Right. How about that? Yeah, that's a big one, right? That's a big one. That's a safety issue. Um, yes. Yep. That is that goes to safety. I want to make sure we're going to be okay. I want to make sure I'm going to be okay. Um, and so I, I got to hear- call my husband out here. Tiff, Tiffany, I got to call my husband out here really quickly because this is totally him. <laughs> this is his thing. <laughs> it is. He's and just, that it's never sense. enough. It's never, it's never enough. enough. Right. And but so, not for buying things for no, safety. Exactly like you're saying. It is yeah. safety. And it's this whole idea of I, I have to make sure that we're going to be okay because I don't want to go back there. And if I go back mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. then that's going to feel really awful. And if I go back there, then maybe we won't have enough to eat. Or maybe people yep. will look at me funny like my friends did when I was in fourth grade or in yep, seventh you got grade. It. So you go. um, that's a safety thing. Okay. And then the other one is, I, and this really doesn't get any attention in my opinion. I make so much money, I'm embarrassed. Yeah. So in other words, these are people who they've made so much more money than they ever imagined that they would. And they don't want, they're not like the previous person where they want more for safety. They have more than they need and they don't know what the hell to do with it. And they feel embarrassed by that and they can't talk about it because how can you go up to someone and say, I just have too much damn money. You know, no one's going to say that. That sounds horrible. Yeah, you you what almost you just people? yeah you sound like you're a um uh I I've gone through what this a little mean? bit like we bought a really nice house and then I didn't want anybody to come over because I didn't want anybody <laughs> I I didn't want anybody because I grew also grew up remember I grew up with these grandparents from the depression and literally yeah. the company man you know was was managing how much money they had. And they Mm -hmm. always owed the company man because they lived as farm workers and they went to the company store. And so, you know, excuse my French, but the rich people were assholes. And so that was another message. And so I didn't want anybody to think I was a rich asshole. And I can't tell you how many people who have some, I see wealthy people do two things. They either, um, well, maybe three. One is they sort of hoard it. And, you know, we can go back to the safety thing. Some just spend it like crazy. Um, but so many are like, I, I, it sets you apart from a lot of people. And so how can I talk about that? Because mm-hmm. who can I talk to about that? Because most people don't have a lot of money or excess money. And so you almost feel like you're, you're totally ashamed that, um, um, and you sent me an email about this not too long ago where somebody was asking you that question. 
I am so ashamed. I make all of this money. I don't know what to do with it. Or I don't know how to still be like everybody else because it does set me apart. And, um, and, and that's really, to me, it is, I want to be included, but here I am. I really have set myself apart and I don't know still how to be included with everybody else. And, you know, you can imagine how we can all imagine how if you're married, it's not like those two married people are going to necessarily absorb and handle the situation in the same way. So it could presumably cause conflict because what if they don't agree with how to go about it? Or what if their reasons, what, what if the way they feel about it doesn't even match? You know, there's that. Oh, that happens all the time. Or I, I find out, or, you know, I have the spouse that comes in and, and let's, I'm just going to say he, but I'm not trying to stereotype, but he makes all the money and uh, the wife just spends like crazy and goes and gets credit cards in her own name. And then he doesn't know about them. And, and, and so you can, there's not only a, a message differences, but people handle their money differently. Mm -hmm. And um, that can cause real problems in a marriage when they're not on the same page and they're not dealing with these messages and these issues in in a healthy way. When you got married, things were perfect. You were both in love and life was good. Then somewhere along the line, everything changed. She changed, or maybe he did. Either which way, now your relationship feels, well, hard. I coach husbands and wives who feel lonely, disrespected, or misunderstood in their relationship. So many women today are desperate for their husbands to step up to the plate, to make a decision and to stick to it, to lead rather than to follow. Ladies, you have the power to make it happen. Men respond best to women who are grounded in their feminine core. As for husbands, so many of them want their wives to stop nagging and to just trust them, to smile more and to complain less, to look at them the way they did when they were first dating. Men, you have the power to make it happen. Women respond best to men who are grounded in their masculine core. The secret to lasting love rests in the masculine feminine dance. Once you master it, your relationship will no longer be difficult. You'll be moving with the biological tide rather than against it. And that makes marriage smooth sailing. If you're struggling in your relationship, if you feel frustrated or alone, I can help. Just go to SuzanneVenker.com, that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com, and click on the coaching button at the top. Don't wait another minute to acquire the mindset you need to find love and to sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneVenker.com. Absolutely. And and that's why this is what I want to do. I want to try to get just begin this. Sure. Be- begin sort of unraveling this. We're not going to be able to solve all marital problems here on the program. But I do want to encourage people, especially people who come from very different backgrounds. I mean, that's just a huge one. You know, the wealthy person marries the poor person, but right. vice versa. And then you bring so many different beliefs and um behaviors to the table typically when you're when your backgrounds are that disparate that's yep. that's another thing so so if you want to have I, I mentioned financial intimacy earlier and I noticed a pause I'm not sure I should have explained what I meant by that so I mean it's exactly what you would imagine right there's we talk about emotional intimacy but we don't often talk about financial intimacy and and all it really is is that you and your spouse are on the exact same page and the more I work with coaching couples who are not, the more I've delved into this. And so I've become even sort of a bigger proponent of this. Uh, Also having over the years gotten to a better place just in my own marriage. um, Finally, you know, it took a long time in terms of the budgeting and knowing what's happening with every dollar and um, communicating weekly and, you know, working through some of those issues from our, from that we learned growing up, all of that stuff. And it's really changed our marriage. And so I want other people to experience that. So that's what I mean when I say financial intimacy, when you can get on the same page where you, I mean, you don't even have to blink about worrying whether or not the other person is going to hide a purchase, for example. Right. I hear a lot about this, whether or not there's money, not necessarily hiding a purchase, but there's monies hidden away that they don't know about or that they don't have access to. This is harmful to your marriage. And in order to get that financial intimacy that I believe people, you know, want, but they don't really know how to go about it. You have to begin by what we're talking about now is looking at what our takeaway was about money as a child. And then starting after that, once we've done that and assess that with each other, 
start to follow your dollars and and how you're spending and why. You know, are you lonely? Are you bored? Why do you spend the way you do? Are you, do you feel out of control when you spend? Do you feel guilty? Uh, guilty as charge when you right. do spend. What, right. What is what's the why behind? what you're spending your money on, you know, and what matters to you. If you could spend, because where we spend our money shows what we value, right? Oh, I always say, you know, you, when I get somebody's bank statements, which I do every day of the week, (laughs) I know their life. I know their life. I know their priorities. Yes, you must. I do. That's fascinating. You should see what I see. And so in my mind, the shame has, you have to start with the shame because we all have them. Whether it's all about the money or the debt or, you know, the, the, it's guilt. painful to pay the guilt. The guilt. <laughs> so when you can start taking those feelings that you, you might not even realize are there, but start understanding that they are and unraveling them and bring them, them to the surface. To me, that's the first step because it starts to just release some of that energy and have a conversation about it. And then let's literally lay it on the table. Mm -hmm. Who makes what money? What is our debt? What are our obligations every month? What do we want? Do we really want this big house or do we want a bigger house? Or, you know, do we want to take more trips or whatever it is? What are our priorities? But I, it has to start with the shame. And then I always say you have to become the master of your kingdom. You have to take responsibility for your kingdom and the keys to your kingdom really are your money. And so in order to take control of your kingdom, you have to be able to look at it, even though it's like, oh my God, I have to deal with the fact that I have that debt. Or, oh my gosh, I have to feel like, you know, you, Suzanne, I had a guy. I don't who, have enough money. Or, right. Or I had a guy right, that right. hadn't paid his taxes in 10 years. Yeah. And yeah. Ignorance I, is bliss. Right? Ignorance is bliss. So let's, let's stop that. And let's, let's take the control of the keys and then let's lay it on the line and start understanding where we're at. And from those three spots, those actions will follow. They'll actually be more easier than, oh, let's just set a budget. And then we just forget the budget, right? Because sometimes when we start with actions without dealing with the emotional garbage behind it, we continue to see the same pattern over and over again. And I always... I have found in my own life, I have found with my clients that when you deal with the emotional garbage first and start bringing that to the surface, um, the actions follow much more easily. They do. And in fairness, you know, there's going to be some of those, some of those things that are buried are easier to face than others, right? So, 100%. so mine's probably the, what I explained, and maybe even you is really light light cons- compared to somebody, for example, um, I have a client who, who basically hoards onto the hoards the money because she's afraid of being left and the marriage is going to end and she's got to have this money aside or, or, or she's screwed. Mm-hmm. So she's preparing, essentially she's preparing for divorce. She's, she's already been married and divorced mm. once. And then her parents, bad marriage. So basically she's, she, the whole approach to it is watching out for herself, which of right. course is creating a self-fulfilling prophecy because your marriage isn't good because you're preparing for its demise That's financially. Right. So until you let go of that, you're never going to have this marriage that you say you want, never. right? So, so that's a much bigger hill to climb. So let's be fair and say some of these hills are, are bigger than others. Oh, but at the end are. of the day, they are, they are. And I, we're not trying to pass it off as easy at all. It's just, if it's just, you have to do it if you want to move forward and you want to have, well, specifically for marriage, what I'm calling financial peace or intimacy, so I'd say those, those are the two main things is looking at your, what your takeaway was as a child and dealing with, as you say, the shame that's attached to that. And then following, sitting down, making a decision. We're going to do this. We're going to get real. We're going to follow the dollars. We're going to see what we're doing. And of course, what does that really mean? It means creating a budget. And if you don't have an actual budget, chances are you don't know where every dollar is going. And I'm, and I'm only saying this as another Dave Ramsey pitch because we, my husband and I have only recently done this ourselves and we feel so strongly about it now. It's really changed everything to know where every dollar is going. It totally changes everything. And, you know, if you don't understand, you know, where your shame messages are, then I, th- I say start with every message about money you, you've learned. Money doesn't grow on trees. You have mm-hmm. to earn it. Right. Or, um, 
you know, I need to have this nice house and this nice car and all of these nice things in order for people to like me. Whatever those messages are, just start writing them down because you're going to start figuring out where your where your shame message really lies because some of those things that you write down are going to hit you in the gut. And then you're going to be able to go from there. But but absolutely. you're absolutely right. Once you start um, accepting that there's money, there's plenty of money to be had, uh, that your, your, your ego, your worth as a person, your value, the amount of love that people can give you and you can give other people have nothing to do with money. When you start mm-hmm. releasing all of that, um, oh my gosh, um, it becomes much more easy to deal with the money and to deal with the budget. And, and you will find you will stop by, you know, going down all the lines at Target or aisles at Target and buying all this crap mm-hmm. at Target, right? You don't have to do that anymore. Um, and it's much more powerful and it ends up being more fun because you can enjoy your, we should enjoy our money. Whether it's just Absolutely. going out to eat as a special date or going out to a movie or taking a really wonderful trip, whatever it is, um, we should be able to enjoy our money and also use it to to do the things that we need to do. Amen. I think that's a, a good place to stop, Tiffany. This has just been awesome. I'm I really I'm looking forward to hearing from people about this particular episode. It was a little different from my normal way of things and I loved it and I, uh, I want to do more of it. it sounds awesome. Me and I, I, again, this is a big subject and I'll say it again. I'm having um, Dave Ramsey's daughter on in a few weeks to discuss her new book, know yourself, know your money or know your money, know yourself. I can never get that right. But anyway, so we're going to do a whole other hour on money um, because it is that important and that big. So thank you it so is. much Tiffany, for coming on. And you know, I'm going to have you back. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I love your you show know. and I love this topic and um, it's so fun to talk about and it's 100% um, a, a marriage changer. It's really amazing. When you can get on the same team with your spouse on this issue, yeah. oh my gosh, you can overcome anything. Oh, no question. You are so right. It is such a game changer. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You're here. Okay. Um, Tiffany, real quick. Um Tell people where they can find you. I know so, I probably say it a thousand times in the opening, but say it. That's, that's okay. My professional website is acuityforensics.com, and that's A-C-U-I-T-Y, forensics with an S on the end. And uh, we are very busy right now, but my pl- my blog, when I have time, is letsgetreallife.com. That's letsgetreallife.com. Awesome. Thanks, Tiffany. We'll talk Thank soon. Thank you so much, Suzanne. You take care. Bye-bye. And now for the email of the day, this is from Nicole. Hi, Suzanne. I'm a millennial. I have read Alpha Female, your recent book, and The Bossy Wife Diet. My friend, that Bossy Wife Diet, by the way, is a um, free ebook now that you can access if you'd like by signing up and becoming a subscriber at, Suzanne, at SuzanneVenker.com. You will get that downloaded immediately in your inbox, and it's a seven-day challenge to sort of try out my theory, if you will, and see how it works. Hint, it does. My friend and I have been deliberating over the topic and some thoughts that came were, that came about were, one, how can the man have total control when the woman is contributing equal to the man? She means financially, I guess. Two, if I'm constantly sacrificing my wants for you, how can there be happiness? Three, how can you function while constantly giving, relinquishing without receiving? Okay, so, and I think this is partially because she's a millennial, because I wrote back to her, I'm going to just read it to you. Um, Hi, Nicole, I told her I was going to read this on the show today, and then I said, but I have a few questions. Why are you under the impression that I think a woman should sacrifice all of her wants and desires to be happily married, and that she should constantly give and never receive? I hope that wasn't the takeaway from everything you read, because that wasn't my intent. That is not at all what I think a wife should do. The attitude adjustment to which I refer has to do with losing the I am woman, hear me, roar mindset and not needing to have the last word or direct his traffic. And yes, learning when to keep one's mouth shut sometimes. But none of that equates to being docile or a doormat or sacrificing all of one's needs. So I, and she was very kind about it. She was definitely trying to figure it out. And I suggested to her that she's struggling perhaps because she's trying to marry the message she's heard as a millennial 
her whole life about men and marriage with this new, what to her is a new concept, which at the end of the day is really much more about just growing up, being mature, knowing you're not the center of the world, being empathetic instead of adversarial toward men, having and embracing a positive attitude about marriage and teamwork instead of it being tit for tat. I mean, so many of these things are all positive. And I think for those of us over 50, it makes perfect sense, right? But 20s and 30s, which is where the millennials are, it's it's a struggle. And that saddens me. But I'm open to certainly working with that group. And I, I, I usually, I'll be honest with you, most of my coaching clients are older, you know, because I said to this, this girl, Nicole, I said, pretty much, you're going to be more receptive to this, and it's going to be easier to understand once you've been married, and you're in it, and you're seeing what's not working, then you're like, Oh, give me something new to work with, right? Anyway, so I wanted to read that to you. So you can um, to just sort of clarify for people who are trying to figure out what my message ultimately is and how that, um, and, and more importantly, what it's not. And it's certainly not what the takeaway was for her. I hope that helps, Nicole. And that ends this hour of The Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to tune in next week when we talk with author Adam Alter, who wrote a book called Irresistible, The Rise of Addictive Technology and the Business of Keeping Us Hooked. Adam's going to be here to talk about how your tech addiction may be hurting your relationships at home. Don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook. Just type in The Suzanne Venker Show in the Facebook search bar and you will find it. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.